Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to today's session. Happy Friday. I am Nelly Yusupova. For those of you who don't know me, I am a CTO, startup tech advisor, and creator of TechSpeak for Entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you about that in a second. I wanted to welcome you first to uh, this session today. Uh, we usually do these seemingly every two weeks. Sometimes I try to do it every, every week, depending on my schedule. And the goal of this session, the goal of today, is to make sure that I answer whatever questions that you guys have in terms of running a startup, uh, being a founder, working with a team, how do you build a product, how do you iterate on it quickly, all of those questions, co-founders, whatever questions that you have, my goal is to make sure that you understand what you can do to get yourself in a better place to take that next action that's going to make the big difference. So that's what these sessions are all about. The structure of it is, um, is usually I start with some kind of an introduction where um, I'll talk about some topic that's been on my mind. And then we'll dive into the Q&A. By the way, we are also live streaming this to other platforms as well. So if you want to see me on video, you can do that. But if you are in uh, YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn and you want to ask the questions live, come back and join us in Clubhouse and you can come up on stage and ask your question live. If you uh, want to ask a question in the chat, I see the chat. I'm keeping an eye on it. So type your questions in there and I'll answer them as we go through. This session is going to be about an hour. Uh, we'll see how far we get through and how many questions we can answer. So uh, one thing that I want to talk about today and the discussion I want to center us on is around the resistance I see when entrepreneurs need to go back to validation over and over and over again. So I'm, I was mentoring an entrepreneur yesterday who shared her business for a product that's already built. So she is a very much early stage founder, but she already has some version of a minimal viable product built. She said to me that she did some customer development through surveys, which if you have ever taken my free classes, which if you are wondering where to get them, the link is pinned to the top of the room. Go check them out. If you have ever taken my free classes, you will know that surveys are not very good tools to use at the beginning to do customer development. They're, all, they're great tools to learn on a bigger scale later in your product development process, but never at the beginning. So, so she used surveys, and I don't recommend that because customer validation is about focusing on the problems and not solutions. And most people build their product without clearly understanding the problem that they're solving. And if that problem is really a painkiller, what I call level 12 out of 10 problem, and not just what I see a level five, six, or seven problem. It's not enough to solve a problem. You need to find a problem that someone actually needs solved and that that market is big enough for you to be able to be a profitable business. So the goal is to never just to build a product. The goal is to build a business around your product. And that's what we're talking about here. Validation will help you with all of that. Understanding the nuances around the problem will save you thousands of dollars in recoding later. So getting back to the story, the entrepreneur asked me all kinds of marketing questions. And my number one advice, you guessed it, go back and talk to your customers to figure out how to effectively position your solutions and refine your pitch and sales process. Then you can take your learning and refine the messaging and scale it using technology, using social media, using other channels, etc. But there's so much value in understanding like if you have to pitch your service to a human, you know, you can get instant feedback. You can get and refine your sales pitch and really understand what specific messaging works. So if you are today are struggling to get customers, 
go back and talk to your customers effectively and continuously talking to customers and understanding how to gather data without leading users to your solutions. This is the key. You cannot lead users to your solutions. You want to be able to just extract information from them in an effective manner. That will help you tremendously to build the absolute best product that you can. It will prevent you from spending a lot of money building technology for technology's sake, which I see so much happening in the startup community. And ultimately, it will allow you to reach product market fit a lot faster. So do not resist validation. Embrace it. This is your lesson for today. As we go into the weekend, I want you to take this lesson, think about it, and understand how you can incorporate more of that into your startup. Don't ignore the data. This is another big mistake that I see with entrepreneurs attempting to do this. They're so in love with their solution and the commitment and the time that they spent on building that solution that when they get data from their conversations, they choose to ignore that data if it doesn't agree with what they've already spent time and money building. Think about that. The key is to be an unbiased scientist. Run your startup as a series of well-designed experiments that you are constantly testing where each new data point will help inform your next steps. Learn early, learn often, and learn cheap. That's my mantra. That's the process that I teach. That's everything that you will ever learn from me is all focused around learn early, learn often, and learn cheap. And if you want to learn the TechSpeak 10 step process, check out the free trainings that I have on the website. TechSpeak.co is the website, or if you're in Clubhouse, just click on that link and you'll see the four webinars that I have. Three of them are on demand. How non-techies can launch successful tech startups. How to build an MVP without a technical co-founder. How to cut your product development costs by up to 50%. And finally, I'm doing a live session on Tuesday on how to reach product market fit quickly. So join those learn, and I will teach you in each one of those webinars, step by step by step, how to think about this process. I also have TechSpeak for Entrepreneurs Academy. If you want to get the exact steps for how to implement this process and build products in the lean way and actually understand at what point you need to do what, check out TechSpeak for Entrepreneurs Academy. My goal with all of the resources that I provide you is to save you from costly mistakes that can delay your success for years to come. And I want to show you a clear roadmap to growth, compressing years into months. So just wanted to share, you guys have a very clear thing you can think about over the weekend, and hopefully this will help you move forward past some of the issues that you may be having. With that, I would like to take some questions. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question and if you want to come up to the stage um, to ask it. Uh, oftentimes, um, when you come up to the stage, please move, mute your microphone. So um, we are, if we're in conversation, we're not disrupting the conversation and I'll call on you when it's your time to speak. And uh, the, questions that you guys ask are very, very important for everyone else to learn. So I would encourage amazing questions. Even if you have a question that you think isn't important, someone else in the room has that same exact question. So be brave enough to ask the question, come up to the stage and let's do this. All right. So let's see, Vincent, uh, welcome to the stage for the first question. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask How are you guys doing today? We are doing well, Vincent. How are you? I'm doing my absolute best. We're doing very well. That's great. Yeah. Um, so my mentor gave me his life's work. And um, I'm only about two years in on the tech side of things. Okay. I used to do 
uh, fintech and um, not even tech. I was using fintech. Okay. <laughs> I was a financial advisor for thirteen years, and then I simultaneously was marketing director and PR firm director um, of a couple companies I started. Um, yeah. So basically, the <clears throat> my mentor is one of the best developers in the world. I mean, the top two percent on Crunchbase. Um, he's retired. He's just eight months older than I am, but he's out of the game and, uh, we're just trying to help people. We have the same purpose and, you know, um, basically I have everything from the best AI modules. So like if you want to let's say e-learning, I have one of the best e-learning suites there is that also has, I'm about to integrate, um, the, it's called Corgi. You give it a markdown or textbook, for instance, and it spits out a curriculum, homework, tests. So, um, Vincent, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, are you sharing something or no, are no, you no, no, no. I'm really ask asking question. questions. Okay, I'm just trying great. to give you an idea of what I like, just how so, the depth and breadth of the. Okay, so yeah. actually, it would be really great if you ask your question first. That way we can get the context for what the question is, and then you can give some details. And if I need more details, I'm going to ask you. But right now you're giving me a story. I have no context for it. And so it would be very, very good okay, for me cool. to first have the question, and then we'll, yeah. we'll get into the leads. No problem. Gotcha. I can literally uh, press reset. So um, for uh, exposure campaign, uh, I didn't really like how NFTs were. So we created an AI generative uh, living interactive uh, NFT and platform in which it's meta and this has all been the past two weeks, meta and 3D and metaverse, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, basically one of our NFTs that was just a prototype just jumped up to 2.2 million. Um, so I'm really just trying to figure out, um, well, I'm almost finished with the one I'm working on, which takes my actual art and, or not actual art, my abstract acrylic, which is, yeah. Um, and turns it into a uh, generative art that's also interactive. Okay. You can speed it up, slow it down. Like it's, it's really, really cool. It's a, a niche in the market, if you will. Okay. So what's your question? Yeah. Um, I guess it would be, are there any buddy who needs some opportunity? Um, because I really need some help. And I was going to ask you who would best do that, but just based on how you answered, I, are you well-versed in NFTs? I had no clue about them. Like, like I didn't know how they worked three weeks ago. So you're looking, you're looking for a part, a technical partner. Is that correct? Um, I'm looking for a project leader actually, or a pro like it, or a couple of unit leaders actually. Okay. So Vincent, so I'm going to take this as a lesson for all of us being Please. able so being able, uh, and so Laura, who is listening to us on LinkedIn says, I'm confused. I'm not hearing the question. Right. So like, uh, it's, it's very, very um, tough when you get on stage, you have an opportunity to be able to tell your story and understanding how to ask the question in a clear, concise manner, how to communicate what you do in a very interesting way. Right. So people listen, this is a way for you to not only showcase that you are an amazing communicator, right. And people would be attracted to work with you, but also uh, maybe get someone in the room to say, this is exactly what I can help with. Right. And so oftentimes gotcha. as entrepreneurs, this is like, we're pitching all the time. We're selling oh. all the time, whether you are talking to your girlfriend and, and convincing them to see one movie over another, or you're on stage right now speaking and communicating something. It's very, very important. For you it's, to not it's the purview of business yeah, for me exactly it's, so uh, i respect your guys' uh, craft so much uh and so, i feel like i'm just such a you know 
but you dumb, dumb. That, that's that's okay it. that's okay like there's I, i've only been coding four months and i had like have picked up 40 languages and i'm just having that yeah but Trump's vincent a... vincent it's not about um what I work with a lot of non-technical founders, and this is a great conversation to have because, and I'm glad you asked this, and I'm glad that we're learning through you because. Well, because the thing is, like, let me just finish really quick. I'm not trying to interrupt. Basically, I didn't know how to learn tech. I didn't know tech. I didn't want to learn tech. Um, and then I realized how many others were like that, how many tradesmen, how many businesses were. So I have just immersed myself and I'm now aligned with some of the best mentors and brilliant minds in technology. Yeah. Like, um, it's, and I'm, I feel very blessed and I just want to do the best by them I can. Yeah. And so and do the best for the end users as well. So Vincent, we're going to learn from your story because there is Please. probably a lot of people in here who are non-technical entrepreneurs. I work with a lot of non-technical entrepreneurs for the last 10, 15 years. I've created programs for them. I teach them. And my goal is to, number one, to make help make that shift that you are a non-technical person. So Everybody. That, that, so Vincent, well, let that, me finish. That, hold on, hold on. Let that me, used to be. Right. No, let, no, me, just, let me finish my point. So, uh, and, then, and then you can... Once I'm done, you can jump in and add something else. The key is to really understand that being and learning technology is an ongoing process. It's not like even I'm still learning every day. There is new technologies coming at the speed of light. And for you to understand that starting today, starting today, is the day you need to start because from this point on when you make the decision that i'm going to start to learn the technology not to actually learn how to code necessarily that's not required the key is to understand the nuances of the technology so that when you are working with a technical person you are proficient enough in your language in your communication, in your understanding of what they're saying, and that you're not wasting a lot of time trying to basically translate things, but you are actually having a conversation and a discussion. The key for a non-technical person is to know enough about the subject, whether it's, um, and it's not just, by the way, in tech, Right, but the same thing in marketing, the same thing in SEO, the same thing in every single thing that you're going to be doing is to know enough so that when you hire a professional, you can make the best of that time together. So again, I completely, I completely agree. And based on that, let me reset again. So when it comes to marketing, when it comes to advertising, business development, AI, all these other platforms that I don't have to do the coding myself. Or, and I don't have to engineer. That's I have no problem managing a room, like, or not managing a room, uh, put, like staying on stage and commanding a room if I want to. But I really am here to learn. So that's why I'm like, kind of like, it almost sounds as a little timid. I'm not. Uh, I know I have some of the best technologies there is just because the guy who built them is just a freaking genius. He built the AI for HubSpot. That's great. And so, he's giving me his life's work, and I'm just trying to do best by him. And I apologize. So I'll try and keep my questions more concise and on point. Great. So, Vincent, thanks for sharing. There's another thing that you just triggered that is really important for everyone in the room to understand. So, Vincent has amazing technology. He has something from a brilliant developer. But there's a graveyard full of amazing technologies on a lot of different websites <laughs> that no one has ever used. And that's because they weren't able to successfully find a market for that amazing technology. And the process that I use, the tech speak 10 step process is all about understanding how to find the market first before you build the technology. If you already have a technology, you then, you know, it's they say solution looking for a market <laughs> rather than your market. You already have a market. 
and you know exactly what the solution should be, and then you have confidence that they're going to purchase and or use your technology because you've built that technology with the understanding of what pain point you're solving that for. So I was talking to another founder the other day as a mentor, and they've built an amazing technology for blind people, and they built the technology but now they can't figure out how to market it, right? And so I just was asking them basic questions, basic questions on who they're, who exactly is going to buy this, how they're going to try to sell this. And they had some answers and they were so convinced that there was a problem. As soon as they started poking holes in there, in just by asking simple questions that they, they didn't have answers to, that's painful right? Because they are solving potentially an amazing problem and they have some amazing technology. But if you do the work upfront on understanding how you can leverage this potential technology for a specific use case and do that before you build the tech, you're going to be in a much better position and not waste potentially many years of iteration and recoding later to adjust your solution to a specific market. So Vincent, I, I, I completely agree. I, I've uh, over the past four years, I've reverse engineered this process. I have all my media vehicles. I have my target market salivating, starving for what I need. They're starving for what I'm about to deliver. I'm right. just merely trying to do this. Uh, I, when I say I reverse engineered it to the point that I'm like a priest, I'm doing a, what does he call it? Um, pre, pre-selling, which is yeah. not really like, a, I'm, I don't like that. I like having something to sell, but um, pre-selling. Have... However, Vincent, those are all your mindset mindset um, blockers, right? Pre-selling is an amazing way to get people excited about whatever it is that you're building. It's a great way to build a community around what it is that you're building. You do have to have a very, a lot of confidence that you can deliver, obviously, and you have a plan, you already know that you can deliver and you can build the technology and all of that stuff. But being able to pre-sell, I have a student in my, in my tech speak program who had five letters of intent. He was building a B2B ad tech technology, and he had five letters of intent before he even had a tech team right? Based on the validation and a clickable prototype that he built and refined with potential customers. That okay. is so much easier, right? Like now he, and then he used that to go and raise some initial seed money because he had the connections with the investors. And he proved that there's a potential market that is actually waiting for him and being able to quickly hire a team and, and launch this, that gave the investors confidence that Hey, this is going to be huge. Okay. So, okay, and by the way, so it doesn't guarantee success, but of course, when you already have people clamoring for your thing and you actually get letters of intent from them, or you actually get paid from them, which happened as well. A lot of my students tried to pre-sell their solutions, get paid in advance to build their solution. That is a much better way to be in because that gives you confidence that, Hey, if you invest in building this thing, there is somebody who's interested in it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. And uh, when it comes to the blind, uh, um, the gentleman or woman you were speaking of, uh, direct them towards me. Uh, I have in real time solved sign language to spoken uh, uh, speech and or audible speech and written text in real time. That's just one of my like 87 uh, MVPs that are 85 to 95% done. Okay. And I have lots and lots and lots of clients who want this. It's just, I'm really just trying to do it. I'm just trying to make the guy who gave it to me proud. All right. Well, Vincent, good luck. Thanks for coming up. Uh, we're going to move yep, on. Uh, to... me back down. Thanks. Great. Uh, or you can stay on stage, just, uh, stay muted. We're going to go to Mark. And then I also have a question from Jerusalem in Facebook, which we'll take next. Uh, so, Mark, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. And let's let's keep the questions concise. So we st we'll start with my question is, and then we'll give the context for the question if we need it later. 
Go ahead, Mark. Um, so my question is, um, let's say, take a couple steps, steps back. Um, and let's say someone wants to start a tech company. If they're playing the long game, are there any benefits to delaying the process of creating a company to become a technical founder instead of just creating a company without any technical skills per se? Mark, this is an amazing question. So the question, I'm going to repeat it for everyone else. So the question is, when you're starting out and you're playing the long game, is it better if you're a non-technical person to learn how to code so that you can be the technical founder? Or is it better to just start and try to find a technical co-founder? Is that correct, Mark? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So I love this question because it is so controversial. And Mark, I'm going to mute you just so that there's no uh, feedback from it, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so I love this question because to me, me, being able to launch your solution really quickly is the one thing that I try to optimize for because missing an opportunity is a very real thing in the tech space. Things are moving so quickly that if you don't jump on this opportunity, you may, you may lose out. So if you are in that situation, you just simply don't have enough time to be able to learn how to code and um, and actually be the technical person on the project. That's the first thing. So the other thing is, do you want to be the technical person? Because for me, it took years. It took years to become a proficient enough coder to actually build something. So let's say you take nine months, you go to a coding boot camp, you become a, a software engineer. In nine months, you're not going to be the person who's able to build enough technology to be able to get you long enough, right? If you are going to be a technical person, uh, you will need to be, um, your, your knowledge will hit a wall very quickly because startups move really fast. So for me, unless you're thinking I'm going to be, uh, you know, I'm in my like 19 and I'm going to take my time or I'm just going into college and I'm going to study computer science, go for it, right? Like knowing how to code is never going to hurt you. It's an amazing skill set to have. But for a lot of entrepreneurs who are already business people, they're CEOs, they want to play the role of the CEO. For them to become technical is just not feasible and not realistic. It's not fast enough. That's why right. in uh, in a lot of the programs that I teach, I want my non-technical founders know how to manage the technical team. Ultimately, your goal as a founder is to build a team around you so that you can iterate really quickly and launch your products and iterate and refine them and find the customers and increase the product velocity with which you are working. Okay. So that's ultimately your goal. And um, what you want to do is focus on that. So depending on what your goals are, how much time you have, it may or may not be the right strategy for you to learn how to code. Um, hopefully that helps, Mark. I don't know if you have follow-up questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and let's have a discussion. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, it makes sense. So, so from what I understand is, let's say you have an opportunity now, then it, it's, it's not, it's better to learn, to build a team that builds the business um, yes. from the technical standpoint, instead of trying to, to learn to code. Yes, um, and this is the, the other thing, Mark, is that when we say technical, there's so many different types of technical people, right? Technology is giant. So if, if you wanna build a mobile app, you need certain uh, levels of expertise. If you want to build a web app, similar but very different programming languages, right? Then there's AI, there's blockchain. Each one of those fields is an expertise that you may or may not know about, right? Uh, and, and you need to become deep, uh, a, a deep expert in something to be the technical person in the startup for that. 
And it's just impossible unless you're in that space. Like for me to learn a new technology is very quick because I already have a lot of foundational base. So I can just jump in and start learning. And within a couple of weeks, a couple of months, I am a pr pretty proficient expert in something brand new. But for a non-technical person, it's just not fast enough to be able to unramp that quickly. And so your job as the founder is to understand on the high level all about all the different technologies and how they work, all the different programming languages and all the connections between them. And then you can hire the right people. First of all, you'll know who are the right people that I need to hire. You'll know how to communicate with them. You'll know how to manage the team and align them, get them focused on the one singular focus, which is your product and how to iterate as a team. I call that product velocity to move there very quickly, okay? Okay, so it would be possible to, I guess I, I had the wrong assumption where I, so it, so I guess, sorry, the question would be, so it is possible to have a high level understanding kind of macro perspective on different technologies without having that uh, fundamental programming knowledge. Absolutely, I, I teach this in my tech speak for Entrepreneurs Academy curriculum. I have an entire process that I've developed for non-technical founders, the foundational knowledge that you need to be able to not only speak the tech, but also the specific processes and frameworks that you should use to manage the team so that you can move there quickly. And if you have those skill sets, you should be good to go. You should, uh, you should have enough to be able to hire the right people and iterate on the product with them because you are now the leader of the team, because you, you never want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to be the person who can get the smartest people to help you solve problems. And you, but you still need to have a, a, a base. Yes. A, a base knowledge to be able to communicate with them. And, and uh, exactly. Yeah. So the analogy I'm going to use is um, taking your car to a mechanic. If you, know something about cars you're going to be way better off in understanding what the mechanic tells you right or versus you speak no tech uh no car like you go completely blind and you say my car doesn't work and then they can take advantage of you they can say stuff that is broken and it makes no sense right like if you have no understanding of what's broken you will pay an arm and a leg if you don't speak the the language when you take take the car to a mechanic the same thing happens in every single field so what i tell what we're talking about in tech you need to also speak marketing you need to speak sales you need to speak financials again enough so that you can when you hire a financial expert or a marketing expert understand are they using the right strategies are they guiding me correctly and then you can work with them to move your startup forward, but you're not going to, it's not unrealistic for you to become an expert in everything. It's it, when you're building a startup, it's not just about the product. This is what a lot of non-technical people don't understand. They are so focused on building the product that they forget that the goal the is to build a business, yeah, <laughs> right? And yes. Exactly. And to build a business, you need to have marketing and sales. You need to have business development. You need to have all of these things that support the actual sales process when it comes to the product itself, right? The product has to work and it has to support what you're doing, but it's not the only piece. So that's why it's so important for you as the leader, the CEO, to understand the jobs of everybody have processes for you to manage your team effectively and know how to hire the right people into the role so that they can then help you get your startup forward very quickly. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Cause yeah, sorry, last question here. Cause um, just to, to confirm, I, 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 I probably understood cause last seven years I've been sales marketing consultant. Uh, well, I, Five, past five years I've been a consultant, had great success. I don't think I've mastered both sales and marketing, but I've had, I have a deep understanding and I could perform very well. But I wanted to create, I, I love entrepreneurship. I like the aspect of creating companies. And I want it, if it's not innovative, it doesn't excite me. So that means it's got to be tech company. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'm at a fork in the road where either I 
continue to try to master uh, distribution, kind of sales and marketing, or I try to learn coding, programming, software engineering, product dev, and then start a company. And so from yeah. what I understand, it's possible to both ways, both ways are, are can, can lead to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Check out. So I have a webinar in the link that's pinned to, uh, to this room. Uh, yeah. And for those of you who are listening, it's techspeak.co and then click on free classes. So there's four master classes in there that would help you, Mark. One specifically on how to build an MVP without a technical co-founder. Check that one out. That would be exactly what you need. I'll show you the framework that you should follow um, and essentially um, make you a good leader, right? And the approach that you should be taking. Because if you already have domain expertise in one thing, you can then, um, in the short term, you need to be able to, you know, do that job. But also two other things that you will do if you, according to my process, is you're going to be the product manager and you're going to be the project manager. And that's what I'm going to be teaching you in the webinars, right? What does that entail? And being the product person initially is what's going to be important for you as a founder to learn. And that's what I teach in my trainings. And uh, the lean product manager is really important because I don't know when you walked into this room, we talked about learn early, learn often, learn cheap, and really focusing on customer first, finding the market first, then building the solution. That's what lean product, manage, product, product management is all about. And project management should be agile project management. And this is where you have the systems and the processes to get your team to iterate really quickly on the code so that they're launching early and often. And then there's a 10 step process of all, all the other steps that support what I'm talking about. So once you learn that, you don't need much. <laughs> you don't need to learn how to code. You just will have enough foundational knowledge. And as I said earlier, learning technology is just the beginning. Your job from that point on is to continue to learn about all the different new things that are coming up. And you just need to learn them on the surface level enough to then when you're talking to an expert to be able to ask better questions to know when they're trying to um put pull wool over your eyes which happens so much right or they're guiding you incorrectly so many things it's all about minimizing mistakes and catching those red flags before they become big giant and expensive problems so check out those webinars uh, hopefully that'll be helpful for you and then come back and ask more questions Perfect, Nelly. Thank you. I appreciate your time. You're welcome, Mark. Amazing question. Thanks for asking that. Um, so let's uh, go to LinkedIn and then uh, let me just uh, refresh. And then we have um, Ashana is going to go next. Okay. So Jerusalem is uh, asking, um, I would like to learn from you how to test the product before important investment. We are working on an e-commerce store and before going to a large investment, we want to make sure that there is a market for our product. So Jerusalem, we've been talking a lot about this concept of finding the market first. Uh, if you have an e-commerce store, it's very easy to get started. All you have to do is, um, First, maybe get a picture of the product, put it online, right, and and start to sell it. You can go to a Shopify store. This is I'm teaching you how to run that experiment. Open up a store on Shopify, upload the pictures of your product, and see how many people will buy. Then you're then you're trying to market, right, and build a an audience. And if you see that, and you don't even have to have an inventory as long as you're able to take the product, place an order, deliver it to the person. You don't have to have the inventory. But once you know what people are actually interested in buying, then you can start to figure out how to make better margins on that, right? But you are learning so much by just doing an experiment and launching as quickly as possible. Hopefully that helps Jerusalem. Let's see. Um, Ashana, welcome to the stage. Hello, thank you. Um, 
My question um, is related to MVPs. You kind of answered it, um, I think, earlier, but I just want to kind of make sure I, I have it clarified. Okay. What do you think about um, MVPs that are, you know how there's um, Fiverr, for example, and you can get Fiverr, a Fiverr developer to create something based on like a template like a template-based uh, WordPress site, for example. Um, what do you think about that for MVPs, or do you think it should be a little bit more customized um, to whatever your product or service is? So, Ashana, Ashana, it's a great question. MVPs vary, right? The, the definition, of, the, my definition of, of an MVP is... Um, being able to provide enough value to your customers, right? It's the most minimal version of the product, but that still provides value to your customers. That's what the definition of my definition of, of an MVP is. Now, and it's different for different types of products. The key is to be able to launch that MVP as quickly as possible. And if you're able to use no code tools, low code tools, uh, web, some, some kind of a template that will allow you to start to gather data of what works and what doesn't. You are learning so much. Let's say that that solution provides enough value to your customers for six months and you outgrow it. That in that six months, you've learned so much that you can then take those insights into whatever custom solution that or more robust solution that you then build. It all goes back to understanding what your customers' needs and pain points are, which is validation. It's the most important step in the process. It's very important to do validation right. It's important to never lead your customers to any specific solution. If you notice, every single time a founder asks me a question, they're always asking a question about the solution without realizing that they don't really understand the pain point well enough. The pain point, when I talk to founders and I start to poke the, the, the holes in, in whatever their understanding of the problem is, is that it's a level five or six or seven problem. And when you're solving a level five or six or seven problem, it's a need, it's a, it's a, it's a nice to have versus a need to have. It's a vitamin versus a painkiller. And our goal is to find a painkiller because if you can find a painkiller, it's so much easier to sell the product. The product will sell itself, right? You already know exactly who the customers are that need it. And you can then grow from there. You'll know exactly how to communicate the value of what it is that you're building from your, from your interviews. You'll know exactly how to sell it, how to acquire your customers, the specific marketing messages that work. Uh, all of these things are going to be so much easier if you follow this process and you spend enough time to be able to do that and then understand what specific solution should be and what the minimal viable product should be because to be able to provide that value that we talked about you need to be able to understand what the problem is and what will people pay for what is that minimal amount of value that you need to provide that you can start to collect users uh payments right the goal is to really optimize for revenue and by the way when I say payments, you want to be able to build a business, right? So you want to be able to charge customers. But depending on your business model, you may need a lot of eyeballs because you're, you, let's say you have an advertising model. Payment with time is also a payment. Right now, we think about how much, how many uh, tools or how many apps you have in your phone. And most of us, have hundreds of apps downloaded but never used and you don't want to be one of those people where people download your 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 uh, solution and they never use it so how do you get the community engaged enough how do you find a pain point big enough that you don't become 
one of those tools that people download and never use. So that's a Sean, a, Sean a, a, a long answer to your question, but that's how you really understand what should be my MVP and is it good enough? The technology, the way you deliver it, I don't care about. As long as you provide that value to your customers. Some of the MVPs require one-on-one -on -one custom work for the initial customer so that you can understand what that product should be, right? You're doing everything manually, but that's okay. Uh, there's a great, great essay that was written by Paul Graham from Y Combinator that talked about to doing things that don't scale earlier on in your startup do things that don't scale don't automate using technology unless or until you know that it's so inefficient to do it manually that's the idea so some mvps are actually having no technology at all uh somebody asked earlier about uh so we had a question from Jer Jer jerusalem about e-commerce, right? My recommendation was to get started with, instead of building your custom store, just go on Shopify, create your store there. You don't even have to uh, create a, your custom template if you don't need to, right? Just put in the product and start selling. The key is to launch as quickly as possible and whatever delivery technology delivery mechanism that you can use to get there, the better. Hopefully that answers your question, Ashana. It does. Thank you. You know, I think back to uh, Clubhouse is such a, a great example of when Clubhouse first started, how Absolutely. the interface just looked really horrible. I mean, I remember when I first got on Clubhouse, I was like, what is this? It's, I mean, the, the value was good, but the way it looked was just really quonky and just didn't really look that great. And then as time has gone on, I've seen all of the additions that they've made. I mean, it, it does kind of look the same, but it still has more of a, it just feels better. And yeah. I think that, you know, when they first started, they had to validate the idea and, and validate to investors that people wanted to be on Clubhouse. I do think that, you know, the investors that they had, um, you know, helped out a lot, you know, because when you do have a powerful, Absolutely. Um, powerful investors behind you, you know, that validates you off top anyway. So, which I think for, for me, um, I've been in technology, been a tech recruiter for many years. And I think for me, being an African-American woman, um, I mean, women in tech, I mean, as you know, it's, it's already a very marginal amount of, of women in tech that then when you put the uh, nuance of being African-American um, and then, you know, starting a tech company and having having knowledge of tech, but not being a coder or not being someone who's an actual, um, you know, computer engineering, uh, with a computer engineering degree, you know, how does someone really, how can you really validate you know, the fact that you are a tech founder yeah. and do starting a tech company when you don't have, you know, certain names and investors behind you. But you so know, like Ashana, Ashana, that, I want to, I want to address that actually, because there's sure. a lot of founders that I work with uh, who are non-technical, who are female, who are African-American and the power and the key is it's a, it's a limiting self-belief. Nobody, and it's become sexy to say, like, you have to have a technical person and um, you, if you're, if you know how to code, you're a God, right? That's BS, like BS in general. Being technical doesn't make you a good CEO. And every single person in your company has a value that they're bringing. Your job as the CEO is to own that and be confident in the value that you bring to the table. And I'll share an example of someone in the beginning. This is going to, I think, hopefully help you. When I launched TechSpeak in 2012, the very first cohort of students that I had, there was a woman in it and she applied to an accelerator. She was non-technical and with a marketing background. She applied to an accelerator in Florida 
And they didn't take her because she didn't have a technical co-founder. She didn't have a technical background and whatever else. So she came to TechSpeak and it was at that time uh, learning over a weekend. So in two days, she learned my process. She learned the confidence and learned all of this stuff. And she went back. She put together the exact plan that she was going to use to launch her product. I mean, she did the whole thing right? And these are the technologies that she's going to be using. This is the type of team structure she'll have. This is how she's going to be managing the project, right? She's now, she learned two skills, how to be a product manager, how to be a project manager, and know how to manage the team to be able to iterate really quickly. That's what she had for her. So she went back to the accelerator and they took her back. Like they actually accepted her, even though she didn't have a technical co-founder, because at that time it didn't matter. She showed that that she knows exactly what she's doing and that she is going to, she has a plan, right? And she told that story confidently. Often entrep- uh, investors or everyone else requires you to have a technical co-founder simply because it de-risks their investment. It is true that if you have no idea how to manage a team, if you don't know how to communicate properly, you don't know how to do this thing as a non-technical founder, you are a big risk. I've seen thousands and thousands of dollars lost simply because non-technical founders just weren't, they couldn't, they weren't um, knowledgeable enough to know what they don't know, to how to handle certain situations and how to see the red flags before they become giant expensive problems. If you are in that position, you are a huge risk. But if you get the knowledge that you need, if you get the resources and the support that you need, and you're able to hire the right people around you and be a true CEO, a leader, you don't have to be a technical person. That's what the value that you bring. And owning that, telling that story confidently, uh, that's going. That's all you need. So hopefully, Ashana, that story is going to change some of your mindset and go check out some of the resources I have uh, from a uh, tech speak, because I think that will, that's enough for you to get going and be able to communicate uh, confidently about the value that you bring in as a CEO. And oftentimes you can get a technical co-founder. It may not happen right away. I, t- I talk about earning a technical co-founder in some of my free webinars, go check that out. Um, but what my, a lot of my founders realize is that, hey, if I know how to manage a team and I know how to do product you know, product management and project management initially, hey, why do I need a technical co-founder? Maybe I just need a very strong technical lead and I don't I can give them equity, but I'm not giving them half of my company. Do you see that? It's like, it's a huge shift. It gives you a lot more opportunities on how to approach building your company. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Nelly. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Nice to see you. You guys have a great day. Nice to see you. Thanks for asking that question. It is such an important question because um, so many founders have that limiting belief. It's been told to us by many different articles and investors and this and this and this and this and this that you need to be technical to be valuable so many well, technical- I think also I, mean, I think also as someone who's been uh, a tech recruiter for you know some of the top companies some of the top tech companies in the world um, you see how women are treated I mean you see it firsthand um, yeah. and, and and when you see that, you, you you do have those beliefs, you know, because yeah. you're seeing firsthand not only from a hiring process, but from an exiting process, and why women are leaving, you know, companies, you know, and yeah. they, it, it, and you just constantly. Get, and I've been in the industry for 16 years, so I've seen a lot <laughs> in the tech world. Um, so so I think that, but that's great insight, and that's 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 great that. You know those those words of, of of advice and inspiration, and I'm going to follow you and check out your webinars and uh, check out some of your your other rooms that uh, that you're you're uh, holding. Great. Hopefully, some of my confidence will get into you because you already have everything you need to be able to make this happen. Okay. You just Thank you so you much. Know, there's so much out there 
and the mindset is the number one most important thing. Your belief in that you can do this and what's the, the opportunity that we have as women or any marginalized community is that we can build our own companies and create cultures where we can stop some of the things that we saw in bigger companies. And we don't have to run our companies that way. And people who may want to work and come with to work for us because we have the things that, you know, the values that we want to build our companies with. And so we can change that. And the power in starting a company rather than going to work for one is that you create the culture where you want to work. And that as you know, that's our duty <laughs> as founders who are starting companies. If you see injustice and you want to change things, you can do that in your own company. So Ashana, great to meet Thank you. Thank you so much. You as well. Have a blessed rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Bye-bye. Uh, we'll have Ruben uh, next. And then we have another question in, from Danielle uh, in LinkedIn. And uh, I'll take that question next. All right. So uh, Ruben, feel free to unmute and uh, ask a question. Hello, Nelly. Hello, everyone. Um, just a little background. My name uh, is Ruben. I'm, I'm from Costa Rica. I'm a social entrepreneur. And I've been working with local governments and re the recycling uh, and management of of, uh, of how the process of the recycling can get better. Uh, the collections, uh, how to collect the uh, how to work with the um, with the different communities, and we developed a tool with um, it's it's a prototype, and and we did develop this tool with the actual customer, with the local government, and with the actual government. So uh, we went through the whole process, and and you know, it's a prototype that can get better, but the thing is our developer in this whole process um let's just say he worked with us and he was fine but we came to a point where we need to get more funding or get another developer and work with a different view um because uh it's it's the thing about money okay i know the product is good there's nothing out there such as this and the government, the local government is interested. Um, um, but, and I'm sure like, I don't know if, if we should get, I don't know where could we start as far as like, should we get a contract with our current prototype to develop or actually in, so to speak, like have uh, our first couple of customers to pay for the development of the tool mm -hmm. or or, or get funding from other sources. I mean, we already got funding and we it got us where we are. And I would say we're in a good stage um, and we're using AI and and we're using um, uh, GPS technology. And, and, and we've noticed that the, the hurt, the hurts where it hurts for the local governments is communicating with customers and educating them regarding recycling. Mm -hmm. So um, we know, and, and, and I know that the, the solution is there. I mean, we've got so the feedback, Ruben, we got the validation about it. Ruben, mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt you just to, so that I can understand the question that you're asking. And so I'm going to repeat it back to you. And, um, and if I need more details around it, uh, you can tell me more. Uh, because I think there was a question in there, but it kind of got lost yes. with all the other stuff that you were telling me. All right. So I think the question is, uh, you already have some working version of the prototype and you're running out of money, correct? And so is that is the question is the question that you how do you fund the next iteration of your project? Is that correct or what's the question yeah kind of like that i mean it, the, the thing is the only expense that we have right now is the developer uh, or i mean how can we work this out because we either get another we get an, an, a developer that is willing to go with us 
and finish the product and how how then, how far along uh, how much of the product is uh is uh left to finish let's just say the customizing part so that the look let's say the branding our idea is that each customer can customize and brand the product to their customers um okay. so, so they can you know when they uh, let's say i'm just some local government in florida wants to be or want to use the tool so they will use obviously um their local government in so the brand ruben, the ruben i'm gonna they're recycling tool. so i i think i think what i'm gonna suggest to you is this number one and I had a student in my program who's in ed tech who did the same thing. She built a, she, she built the technology and then her developer, she couldn't pay the developer anymore. And we had this long coaching session where we were trying to figure out she was running out of money. She couldn't pay the developer and the technology wasn't built to a full uh, like it had a ton of bells and whistles. It had a ton of functionality, but it wasn't complete. And so she had to make a very, very important decision of just making a stop and deciding how out of the big bloated product that she already has built, what is the MVP? Because a lot of people build way too much technology, Ruben, and I'm going to mute you just because there's a feedback from you. Um, and then you can unmute when, when you want to say something. Okay. So there is a lot of bloated technology that most people build way too much functionality and when i talk about mvp it's really just the core of what it is that you're building if you need specific functionality like branding you can customize that for each of your customers manually put in the different branding that they have you don't have to have built a tool built for that if the rest of the product is already done and that's the only thing that's left that's what you do. You do it manually. Okay. There's so many different ways to solve problems and you have to get creative right now. You, uh, whatever, whatever developer that you found for whatever reason, doesn't want to work for free. Right. And so if they don't believe, if they don't want to volunteer or not volunteer, but like work for, for equity at this point, maybe they're not a good fit. They don't believe in your potential. So at some point you need to make the painful decision that I can't work with this person anymore and start looking for someone else. Uh, but this person also has a lot of knowledge of what it is, what, what has been built so far. And so there's a lot of value in that as well. So you have to decide how to solve this problem so that with one goal, how do I launch my MVP quickly? Because as soon as you launch, you may have two different revenue sources. Customers will pay you for the solution, right? Because they'll, they, you say that they are interested. Uh, maybe you can get them to prepay you and give them some kind of a discount if they pay in advance so that you can really push this forward and finish the MVP. You can go back to your investors and say, because you, I, from what I understand, you mentioned that you've raised a little bit of money and say, I just need X dollars to be able to cover the launch of the MVP. And I already have five letters of intent from local governments who will use this as soon as it's done, right? There's so many different ways to tell that story. It obviously has to be true, but you have to get creative to figure out what's the fastest way that I can build an MVP. Maybe you already have too many, too many things built. I don't know, but reevaluate what you've built, parry down maybe and launch because as soon as you launch, you have so many more opportunities. You can go and sell it to your customers. You can onboard them. You can potentially start to get revenue source. You can go back to investors and say, I already have a working product. We need X to be able to achieve the next milestone. So um, focus, focus, focus on launching that MEP and figure out what is it going to take for you to get there, whether it's with this developer that you have and con communicating with him that, hey, we just have 5% of our product done. Can you 
and figure out a relationship, put in X amount of time to finish this because then we already have customers. Da, 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 da. So this is your ability as the CEO to be able to tell the story and encourage, right? And showcase the opportunity. Because if this person doesn't know that you have these other government contracts ready to go as soon as you launch, maybe he doesn't see the opportunity. Maybe he doesn't know the story. So those are my kind of off the top of my head tips that I would uh, use for you. But the goal, the number one goal is to launch your MVP as quickly as possible because it's going to open up so many more doors to uh, moving forward. Uh, uh, actually, um, the thing is, I haven't, I can't, I think that that's been my mistake. I, I haven't told the developer or how to, how to tell him, like, I mean, I just hired him to develop it. I didn't tell him at one point that, I mean, he could be some kind of get some equity or, um, I have never showed any interest in getting him in the business plan. Uh, but that could be an option. Yeah, as well. And the letters of intent, that could be also a really good help. So thanks for that. Um, Absolutely. Thanks so much. You're welcome. You are welcome, uh, Ruben. That's a great question. So um, we have Danielle in uh, LinkedIn asking you know, for help with what role do I need to hire to manage and deal with an external IT teams provided by IT agencies. So Daniel, I don't know if you're still listening. Um, I teach when you're working with an outsourced team in one of my free webinars on how to build an MVP without a technical co-founder. I talk a lot about outsourcing there and the concept I talk about called developer as a service arrangement. This is where you work with the outsource team as the as though that they were your team and you're managing and in, incorporating your process to managing the team even though the outsourcing team may have their own project manager product manager whatever else right whatever they provide in order for the outsourced relationship outsourced team relationship to work you have to have your own really good process you have to have a dedicated person product manager and or project manager, right? Those are the two roles that you need. And in the beginning, what I find is a lot of founders don't have money to be able to pay for a full-time product manager and a full-time project manager. So then I teach these skills to the founders, not very hard to learn, uh, to be able to do this, right? To be able to manage the team, communicate with them, direct them, give them guidance. This is the only way when you're working so closely with a team that you can be close enough to the problems to make sure that things don't get out of proportion. The, all the stories about outsourcing that we hear, the horror stories are real. It's because they don't have this relationship, developer as a service arrangement relationship set up that a lot of the agencies don't have a lot of transparency. They do what they want by the time you realize that a problem was made it's already three months later and you're now always playing catch up rather than and so expensive like recoding things are so expensive and takes time uh so you lose a lot of time and money if you don't manage this process properly but to answer your question directly it's a product manager and a project manager Check out the webinar on techspeak.co, click on free classes, how to build an MVP without a technical co-founder. That will show you the exact process you should be using and some of the concepts here that I'm talking about. Hopefully that helps you, Danielle. And we will have one more, one last question from Pierre. Pierre, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hi, Nelly. Uh, good morning from my end. I hope everything's going well and uh, really enjoying the conversation. Uh, quick question, um, and you may have kind of touched upon this, but I wanted to raise it just in case. You raised some good points about um, the idea of uh, that someone had, that you know someone could be a technical lead, but they don't have to they have to be very in depth on the technology. Uh, my question is, when you partner with someone, are there things that you should keep in mind? in partnering with someone or partnering with a group and sort of not letting yourself spend too far 
um, kind of keeping keeping the the, the uh, knowledge base that you have for for your tech kind of in sync with each other. Um, and here's what I mean by this: you may have a team where one person is is very skilled, um, very sort of keeping on the pulse of everything. Um, and that person kind of leans forward, maybe faster than the rest of the team. Um, you know, is are there things that um, you've seen or from um, your experience that you can speak to, uh, where um, where there's a co co partner or maybe even just a small group of people running a small um, a startup? Uh, you know, how do you kind of you know make sure that you're kind you know that if you're sort of shallow of, of, as far as technology knowledge. Uh, you know, that the shallowness is the same or similar for everybody else. So that way people can still communicate and not feel that the one person is spinning too far afield and maybe, uh, you know, pulling on a thread and dismantling what the good communication that's there. And thanks again for fielding uh, my question. I really do appreciate it. Yes, uh, Pierre, I just want to make sure I understand the question. So um, you, if you have a team of, let's say, five people, one person is more technical than the rest. Uh, how do you make sure that everyone else doesn't get lagged behind because this person is so far ahead? Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's exactly it. Yes. Okay. So I think it comes down to culture. Being able to hire the people with certain qualities and DNA, I call them DNA qualities. Number one, your company should have DNA qualities and each people that you hire should be a match to those DNA qualities. And so if you hire based on that and you have one person more technical than others, the key and the thing that I hire for all the time is being able to teach and learn to each other. And then I create a culture where people can learn from each other. We have instances where if somebody knows uh, something about a topic, they can teach other people. And so if you have a culture that is... Uh, set like this from day one, you're hiring with that and you're very intentional about it. And then you create activities in your startup on a regular basis where people can learn from each other. That should never be a problem. But there are some people, especially super technical people who talk down to non-technical people. They don't like to teach, right? You want to be able to avoid that because it's a very real thing. Not everybody can teach. Not everybody should teach. <laughs> and so um, either putting the person who is the, the um, most knowledgeable on the spot and getting them to teach, and if they're not interested in teaching, maybe teaching one person in a private setting and then someone else disseminates that knowledge. But at some point, we as team leaders need to realize that building teams is all about building a team, right? And what does that mean when it, in the team environment, everybody learns from each other and everybody needs to be able to teach. And if a person doesn't know how to teach or they don't enjoy it, maybe you can give them classes, maybe you can encourage them to, to develop that area of themselves where they are going to become great teachers. Um, it's very, very important for teams to be able to have that and have a culture that is being set so that learning and teaching is at the core of the culture. If you set that from the very beginning, you will have a really great environment where people are um, very interested. I mean, think about it yourself. Like if you learn something as humans, if we know something new, and we are, get, are given a platform to share that, we're also excited to share the information that we just learned. Uh, most people love sharing. And so if you create a, a, an, an environment where this is acceptable and encouraged, you should not have a problem. I don't know if Pierre, if that answers your question or if you have a follow-up, um, feel free Actually, to Actually, that sparks a really good idea. Um, I like the fact of uh, having, um, uh, I, I'm at a point now in my business, I'm looking to try to partner with people. And the problem is, is that um, I hadn't thought about the teaching and learning aspect part of it, to be honest with you. Um, but, I, but, it, but even just the whole idea, I think is great. And it does answer my question. And thank you so much for it. You're welcome. Great. Uh, so we are out of time for today. I know there's a lot of people who raised their hands and didn't get a chance to come up to the stage. 
but that's okay. We're going to hopefully do this in a week or two, I, at least two weeks, every Friday, I'm trying to do this. Um, so if you want to get to know when we're doing the sessions, jump on my mailing list, go to techspeak.co, sign up for the mailing list. Every single time I am doing a session and going live on Clubhouse, uh, I'm sending an email out and letting you know. So you can add it to your calendar and make sure that you're here to listen to the conversations and or ask questions. Um, so check out the free resources uh, that I have for you on techspeak.co. There's three classes that are on demand, how to cut your product development costs by up to 50%, how to build an MVP without a technical co-founder, how non-techies can launch successful tech startups, and another session that I'm doing live this coming Tuesday on how to build, uh, how to find product market fit really, really quickly. We'll talk and define what is product market fit. Um, and we'll talk a lot about metrics that, will, that you need to keep track of to be able to know that you're on the way to product market fit. And then I'm going to share a, the exact strategy that you should be implementing with your teams to be able to get there really quickly and increase the product velocity with your team. So check that out. That's uh, absolutely free. It's coming uh, up on Tuesday at 11, sorry, on Wednesday this week uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, thank you so much for all the questions, for joining me live. Um, I look forward to supporting you on your startup journey and um, have a great afternoon. Have a great Friday and a weekend. And let's see, the question I had for you or the challenge I had for you this week was to think about validation. Don't think about validation as the one thing that you're doing at the very beginning. Every single day, you should be thinking, how can I get to talk to my customers? and take those insights into your products, into your startup, into your strategy, and really refining and iterating very, very quickly. Your customer validation does not stop as you're building the product. The more you do it, the better off you are because you're getting insights that will, and you're getting data that can help inform the next steps in your startup. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, and I will talk to you soon.